Excellent. Well, thanks very much for this opportunity to talk about Groundwater Recharge and the project that we have been developing under the UpGrow program. So there's many people been involved in this particular presentation that I'm going to give today and all their names are there. We've got people from uh, Nigeria and Ethiopia and South Africa, Niger, France, UK and the US, all looking at groundwater recharge. And uh, the reason for doing this is to try and understand what will happen to groundwater abstraction with different future groundwater recharge regime, regimes. So really trying to answer this question, will the pumps actually run dry? And I'll now try and navigate to my next slide, which I've done successfully, so I now feel very proud. Why should we worry about groundwater recharge? Well, the main reasons for thinking about groundwater recharge are to do with sustainability of water supply. Uh, the, the slide that I just shown there just now on the top left, we see somebody taking water from a from a hand dug well, a shallow hand dug well, and they maybe don't take out very much water, but it still needs to be recharged. It still needs to be replenished on a regular basis. At the bottom, we've got somebody with a hand pump, maybe using a bit more water, a community maybe using 10 a cubic kilometer, uh, 10 a, a cubic meters per day. Again, that needs to be replenished. And in the middle slide there, you see a pivot irrigator, which uses orders of magnitude more water, uh, more groundwater. So we need to think about groundwater recharge to try and understand how sustainable water supplies might be from hand pumps, from hand dug wells or for large irrigation schemes. But somebody, uh, our team published some work uh, looking at the groundwater storage in Africa and showed there was a lot of groundwater storage across the continent. So does sustainability really matter? Well, I'd argue very much so sustainability does matter because even if there's a lot of groundwater there, if you're taking out more water than's going in over a long period, then groundwater levels can begin to decline. And when they decline, then you can have a lot of unwanted impacts, such as shallower wells uh, beginning to dry up. So the, if the water table dra drops, then maybe the lady in the top left there who's taking water from a, a hand dug well, maybe that well will dry up. We also have ecological impacts. As the groundwater levels fall, then uh, river, the base flow to rivers reduced, and you might have a lot of ecological impacts. So a sustainable use of groundwater is actually very important, even if there's quite a lot of groundwater stored there. So just a, a slide on, on what groundwater recharge is. And uh, in the background here, we've got a, a picture of northern Nigeria in the Sokoto Basin. Uh, so recharge, of course, starts as rainfall. And then much of that rainfall is immediately or very quickly returned to the atmosphere through evaporation or evapotranspiration through plants. So a large amount, volume of that water is, is returned to the atmosphere very quickly. Some excess water will then run off. Uh, it will then flow to streams and rivers close by to provide the, the river flow that, that we need. And a small proportion of that excess water will actually recharge through the soil into the aquifers beneath. So groundwater recharge really is, is an overflow, is an excess of soil moisture that then goes down into the, into the aquifers beneath. It's very hard to measure, it's hard to quantify, and it's quite an elusive uh, aspect of, of hydrogeology and of water management in general. So how do we try and measure groundwater recharge? Well, there's various methods. Uh, I'll just run through them very quickly here. There's, there's physical methods, so actually looking at changes in the water table. So the, the picture on the top right there is a borehole hydrograph. So looking at how the water, the water table fluctuates every year, seasonally, will tell us a little bit about groundwater recharge, how, much, how the water is changing. Then we've got some, uh, some other techniques using environmental tracers such as stable isotopes or dissolved gases such as CSC, SS6 or bomb tritium from the nuclear testing in the 1950s. And these 
these uh, techniques can help us uh, fingerprint when rainfall actually it was recharged, when the recharge, the groundwater that you're looking at, when it was actually recharged with rainfall. So it takes quite a bit of effort to try and interpret these types of uh, uh, isotopes and uh, the environmental tracers, but it gives you quite a lot of insight into when the groundwater actually was recharged. There's other methods that can be used in semi-arid areas, uh, accounting for chloride. Chloride is a conservative element, so you don't expect chloride to disappear. Once it, if it's in the in the rainfall, it isn't taken up by other other processes. Thanks very much for that. That's great. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, disappear, so it's conservative. So if it accumulates in the groundwater, then you you know that the uh, you can estimate a little bit of how much has evaporated and how much uh, water, how, much, how the chloride has been concentrated. So that can be quite a useful method in semi-arid areas. And then there's other methods uh, using modelling methods. So that's to do with sort of uh, soil physics. So you model how much uh, w uh, water goes through the soil to beneath. And there's, there's the standard ways. Penman and teeth and other ways of doing that. We try and account for the soil moisture, how much gets returned to the atmosphere, and model how much can go down through through the through the base. <clears throat> and then there's actually direct soil physics me me measurement, and that's where you try and uh, and actually touch the, the the water itself. So you're looking at soil moisture measurements uh, in the actual soil, and you try and detect the, the the water movement through that soil. So you're directly trying to Look at how the water moves through the soil in an unsaturated zone. Again, quite quite tricky to interpret, and you need some sophisticated equipment. But it's another another uh, tool in the toolbox. And lastly, we have these water balance methods where we try and work out how much water has gone in, how much water is going out, and try and estimate then how much must have gone to groundwater. And uh, a way of doing that can be looking at base flow in rivers and uh, working out uh, how much water there is in the river when it hasn't been raining for a long period of time, and then attributing that to groundwater. So these water balance methods. So se several techniques to try and understand recharge, but you might notice there's not one single method that directly uh, is the Eureka method for telling us what groundwater recharge is. Generally, what we have to do is use a combination of methods to try and understand recharge. And we have to look at the processes behind Recharge. What is what is giving that groundwater recharge? So, of course, groundwater recharge starts as rainfall, and rainfall across uh, Africa is highly variable, uh, both in, in in space and in time. So, the the map on the left is the 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 average annual rainfall from 1951 to 2000, and shows the great variety in the annual rainfall that we have. Across across Africa, and particularly if you think of uh, of populated Africa, it generally be be where rainfall is more than about 500 millimeters per year. It's where people tend to live, and you can see there's high rainfall gradients, particularly across the Sahel. So it's highly variable in terms of space, but also it's highly variable temporarily. Of course, within the year we have seasonal seasonality, and might be three or four months of the year where uh, rainfall falls. Uh, but also decadally, decadally. and uh, the graph I'm showing there in the bottom right shows the rainfall in the Sahel from the 19th century, uh, during the whole of the 20th century, and you can see how rainfall, particularly in the latter half, the latter third of the century, was much, much lower than the, than the average before that. So you have these longer-term cycles as well, and uh, with climate change predictions are that rainfall will become much more uh, much more variable and there'll be more intense rainfall events. So we have a, a, a changing, a possible increase in intensity in the in rainfall and uh, the sort of storminess. So we have very variable, unpredictable rainfall. So the way that recharge is looked at at the moment in its kind of continental uh, way is to, to there's these continental recharge models which are are quite uh, are quite widely quoted. The one on the left is, 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 is the famous one from Petra Doll, the water gap model, and then I've put one on the right that we've been developing using slightly different, uh, different a different model, a different approach. But these continental models 
are trying to represent that complexity in rainfall and in process to estimate groundwater recharge. And of course, they don't, don't do it very well because it's at a continental scale and uh, they can't really mimic the processes that are happening with this uh, highly variable rainfall and the vari variable uh, uh, conditions that you find on the ground. But they, they are used a huge amount. So when people are, are, are trying to see whether groundwater is over abstracted in in parts of Africa, they'll use a model like this and they'll subtract this away from how much is used to give an idea of sustainability. So these recharge models is what a lot of people's estimates are based on at the moment. Uh, if you look at things from the World Bank or at these sort of higher level papers, these overview papers, they tend to use these kind of models, but they are really flawed necessarily because they don't have the observations to go into them. They're based on a kind of uh, a modeling approach. So they, they are flawed, but they're the best that we have at the moment for the for the continent. So what we are doing as part of our project was trying to collate as much as many of the recharge studies that we could find that were done over the continent. And as part of our project, we've come up with over 200 studies, and we've systematically reviewed them. So the map on the left shows the location of a lot of these studies, and uh, the the confidence is we have in, in how good the study is. From a variety of, uh, of methods, is uh, is from the size of the circle, and uh, we find there's a lot of different techniques and methods that have been used across across the continent. So there's a lot of studies out there already, and what we're trying to do is systematically review them. And here are the results. If we look at the the overall number of studies, you can see in the graph which shows annual average rainfall on the, on the bottom axis, on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have the calculated recharge from the method that, the, that was used in, in each of the studies. We find that there's a general direct relationship. So as rainfall increases, so does calculated recharge. Of course, this is what many people use. Many of us hydrogeologists, we, we often just estimate recharge as being something like 10% of rainfall. And this is probably the reason that we do that. There's this overall general uh, general relationship. Higher rainfall means means higher recharge. But if you look in a little more detail at it, we can see that below maybe about a thousand or seven fifty millimeters, we have this real non-linear behaviour between rainfall and calculated recharge. So below about seven fifty, it isn't a direct relationship between rainfall and recharge. It's much more complicated than that. And when you dig a little deeper, you find that there's, uh, it's very important uh, to understand the intensity of the rainfall events. So much more intense rainfall events sometimes lead to more groundwater recharge. And in fact, some work we did, uh, further work we did reviewing these studies showed that where rainfall was, was concentrated into fewer days, then it was more likely you got higher recharge. There's also importance of land use. Uh, so different land uses might allow greater or lesser recharge. But in, a, in general, if you, look, if you think of this in the context of hand pumps, hand pumps only need about 10 millimetres of rainfall, of recharge, sorry, per year to be sustainable. And you can see across much of these environments, maybe above about 500 millimetres where most people actually live in that kind of area, you find that hand pumps if they're not too close together, will generally be sustainable. So lots of qualifications there, but I would say that hand pumps, if they're not too closely spaced, so maybe they're 500 metres apart, across much of Africa where rainfall is greater than about 500, 700 millimetres, are likely to be sustainable. And my last qualification here uh, in blue is when the, we need to be quite careful about the different techniques used to measure rainfall. Sorry, to measure recharge. Uh, the previous slide that I showed with sort of six or seven different methods for doing groundwater, for estimating groundwater recharge, uh, some of them are biased in different ways. So we need to be, do a little bit more study before we publish this work. Uh, we need to do some more study here to see is there a bias in the data set here between the, the different techniques used and what their the kind of estimated recharge that they're giving us. So in my last uh, five minutes, I'm just going to run through, uh, I think, four examples 
of uh, different studies that uh, part of our, our project team have been involved in looking at groundwater recharge. So, so firstly, I'm looking at uh, this uh, study from uh, the Makatapura well field in uh, Tanzania, which Richard Taylor, who will be the discussant, uh, it, which he led. And here it's very useful to look at this groundwater hydrograph. The top one's a, a hydrograph, so water level variation. And I think it goes from about 1955 up to 2015. That's the kind of axis along the bottom. So you've got about 50, 60 years of, of, uh, of data here. Uh, the bottom graph shows the, the, gra the groundwater abstraction. So you see there's a lot more abstraction in the last sort of 30 years or so. And the one in the middle shows the, the, the rainfall event. But I think just concentrate on the top graph for now, which shows, shows the, the water level variations. And you can see that there's a general groundwater level decline that lasts maybe for 5, 10, maybe 20 years in some cases, a general down, down, downward decline uh, in that period punctuated by very rapid increases in groundwater level so that over the whole 60 years there's no decline. But we have this general trend of decline and then rapid rises again. And uh, the analysis that was done on this hydrograph showed that this was not, uh, the, the rapid rises were not due to changes in abstraction. You can see the, the bottom the abstraction in the last 30 years remained very high. What this was related to was very intense rainfall events. So rainfall events are linked to uh, sort of enzo behavior across Africa. So this shows us here that recharge in this, in this well field was episodic. It wasn't happening every year on a large scale, but every 10 years or so, there was a very large intense rainfall event. And there's more work to be done in this particular well field because we're trying to understand whether that recharge was happening indirectly, so via, via uh, rivers that then flooded, or directly via uh, actual soil, uh, water going directly through the soil from rainfall. rainfall. So that shows us about the episodic nature we can have for recharge. The next one is uh, some work we did across West Africa from uh, the coast in Nigeria up to Mali. Uh, we call it our West African transect. And the graph there shows mean residence time of groundwater along the bottom axis from zero years to, to 70 years. And up the left-hand side is a probability axis. So the 50 of the probability axis uh, will show us where, where the median data data fall. And uh, this transect from wet, 200 millimetres of rainfall, to fairly dry, 400 millimetres in, in Mali, showed that the shallow groundwater had a, a fairly consistent residence time of between 30 and 60 years. And in Mali, where it was, was semi-arid, uh, we were still getting mean annual re recharge of 20 to 40 millimetres per year, which is quite high. But of course, there's other examples in our data set that uh, that you get negligible recharge with, with that amount of rainfall. So the message from this one here was that uh, groundwater residence times were of the order of 30 to 60 years. So uh, the, the, the groundwater you're pumping out of a well might not be directly linked here to last year's rainfall, but maybe to the averages of, of, of rainfall and recharge over the, over the previous decades. And the, the third one I would like to look at is, look, is to get us to think a little bit about potential recharge rather than actual recharge. So what happens to groundwater, uh, sorry, what happens to recharge once it's gone below the soil zone and it's flowing down into the aquifer? Well, it can be intercepted. And this is an example here of how laterite soils are intercepting that groundwater recharge at about three metres depth. So those of you who've worked a lot in Africa will know that the thick tropical soils and laterite soils that you get, and you can, they can be quite permeable. And uh, particularly where the link, where the, the link, the, the move between the permeable laterite and the clay, you can have lateral groundwater movement there. So what this was showing us here was that uh, what we thought would be groundwater recharge didn't actually reach the aquifer because it was moving sideways uh, through the highly permeable laterite. And the last one uh, I want to show you is, is another way of thinking about recharge at a very large scale. And this is using some evidence from satellites, the GRACE satellite, which looks at uh, uh, changes in mass, which can be attributed to terrestrial water over uh, on a kind of monthly basis. And there's, there's a few papers being written about this, and uh, we're just developing something for the African 
sedimentary basins at the moment, trying to find an independent measure of whether water mass is accumulating or, uh, or not accumulating across the continent. So in conclusion, uh, for groundwater recharge across sub-Saharan Africa, I would stick my head out and say that for hand pumps, uh, groundwater re there's generally sufficient groundwater recharge for where a lot of people live. But if we start increasing groundwater use from hand pumps to submersible pumps and for, for irrigation, then it will be quickly unsustainable. And we need to understand a lot more about recharge processes there. I would say we really need observations of groundwater recharge to validate these big continental models that are being used to, to, to make lots of decisions at the moment. And so we can understand processes and how these might change uh, with increasing intense rainfall predicted under future climate. At the moment, we've collated more than 200 studies from across Africa, and we'll be, we'll be publishing that in the next few, few months once we've done a little more QHX, a bit more work. But I would say that beneath about 700, 750 millimetres annual rainfall, we have evidence of a lot of non-linearity between rainfall and recharge. But we must be careful about the methods we're using to, to estimate recharge because some of them are biased in some ways. So we need to use a, a combination of them together. And what we're doing now as a consortium is that we are proposing to put together a network of observatories, groundwater observatories across Africa, to try and better measure and better understand groundwater recharge processes. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much for listening.